well, I got the recorder started about 10 seconds ahead of time, just so that I don't forget to do it. Um, so I'm gonna have a little soft start today. Um, I want to let people know that there is a organization on campus on the first floor of the STEM building called MESA. Um, it is a place for people to get tutoring, um, specifically for you know MESA, Mathematics, Engineering, Science, Achievement. Um, there's a certain requirement you know, for people to be a member of MESA, uh, first generation college student, and um, you can read a little bit down here. It has some qualifications that are needed. And if I remember correctly, it is self-reported. Uh, qualified for financial aid, uh, majoring in the STEM field, computer science is certainly one, uh, working toward transfer and a first bachelor's degree, and I think that meets the requirement of most people in this class. So that's eligibility. Um, and the best part of MESA is when you get tutoring, uh, the same tutor can tutor you on multiple items, um, including you know, basically anything you know, in STEM that your tutor has taken already, the tutor can tutor you. So that means you know, one appointment can mean, oh, okay, we need 10 minutes on Calc 2, and then another 15 minutes on you know, CISP 310, have an hour on CISP 430, and then conclude with you know maybe another you know, 15 minutes on linear algebra. So yeah, I mean it can be a very interesting mix of things, um, and it's also a place for people to gather. You know, basically everybody who hangs out, be it a tutor or people you know, getting tutored, they are all trying to transfer. So you know there's good information exchange over there too. Um, if you are thinking about, you know, well, I don't want to join Mesa as a member, but I think I can, you know, be a tutor for Mesa. Well, do not hesitate, you know, because they are, they do want more tutors, okay? Because, you know, the, the students or the membership of Mesa has increased over time, and they are running out of tutors. They want to extend their hours of service, and there are not enough people to cover all the hours. So if you're interested in uh, becoming a tutor for Mesa, you know, just kind of go into the Mesa Center, which is on the first floor right next to the STEM Center, and just ask the people inside for an application or you know, to ask them about how to apply. Um, it is a paid position as a tutor. So you get paid by the hour. If you don't get anyone to come to you for you know, tutoring, you still get paid by the hour. <clears throat> I'm not trying to encourage people to become so bad of a tutor that nobody wants you to for tutoring. But you know, just say you know you you, you still get paid you know, whether you have you know traffic or not. So it's it's a really cool place to meet you know other people who are on the same track that you are. Um, so particularly, I think people who are taking this class is you know I know a lot of people take this class not as soon as possible. You know, so that means that some people in this class have taken many classes already. So if you think that you want to become a tutor for you know, other people, you know, consider this opportunity. On the other hand, for people who are have finding some difficulties with the material of this class, you, want, you might want to go to the Mesa Center for tutoring because they also have that as a resource. So that's, I think it's a really good resource. So that's one. <clears throat> Two, I, went, I came back from the Academic Senate meeting and the WAG program basically said their enrollment has changed from more than 1,000 students to maybe 100 now. Um, so you might say, you know, but this is not English, right? This is not a writing class. It's not even history. You know, why, why do we need your <clears throat> writing your assistance? Well, because when I read the answers from the exams, I think you know, um, many people can you know, benefit from a writing class, you know, because writing is not about grammar, it's not about English, it's not about history. It is about organizing your thoughts and put it into a written form so that the other person, being me in this case, you know, because I have to grade your exam answers, can understand your answers, can understand your steps, can understand your rationale. So how do you put all of that on paper? Am I the only person who has open-ended questions in exams? I hope not, okay? I may be the only one, but I hope I'm not the only one. So if I'm not the only one, 
then this class can be beneficial for all of your other classes as well. And not just at ARC, but also after you transfer. So consider you know, the, the WAC program if you think that, you know, hmm, I can use some help, you know, understanding how I can best write down my answers regardless of the subject in an exam or in a homework assignment. This is a really good resource. <clears throat> so consider you know, joining the, the, it's a class, it's a half unit class, so you might have to pay out of your pocket because I don't think financial aid is going to help pay for this class, but it's half a unit. So it's what, $21, okay, and there's no textbook. Um, it's both online and also in person, and they allow a little bit of mixed uh, modality. So sometimes when you don't have time, you don't have to show up in person, and other times if you want to show up in person but you sign up for the online class, they're okay with that too. So it's a pretty flexible kind of uh, resource. And one thing about these resources is uh, once you move on to a four-year university, they don't offer this kind of resources, you know, not as much as we do here at a community college. So, <clears throat> so just want to point out some resources. You know, I'm not saying that who needs to go and who does not need to go. You know, you kind of have to kind of self-evaluate and find out whether these programs can potentially be of any help to you. All right. So, having said all that, we are now back to the stuff. Stuff, yes. So this is for today, okay? This is a continuation. So what we're gonna go over today will be labels, uh, the compare instruction, the JMPI instruction, and then you know, one of the JXI instructions. So that's gonna be a little bit of material, but you know, hopefully at this time, you have more understanding of the assembler and also you know, how instructions execute, you know, certain pathways within the processor. So hopefully today's class is not going to be, you know, um, too much of a challenge. But it is being recorded right now. So if you need to, okay, you can just kind of jot down the time and so that you can go back to the recording and just kind of rewatch certain portions of the recording. <clears throat> All right. So let's go ahead and talk about labels. Okay, so I cannot talk about labels without um, bringing up the assembler. Uh, where's my assembler? I don't know where I put my browser. This is logic soon. What is behind it? Nope. <clears throat> well, I thought I put the browser. There we go. Okay, I you know, minimized it. All right, so if I have to explain that, you know, let's go to the assembler. So let me see. We can probably find the assembler tab somewhere. <clears throat> By the way, this is a really great plugin. If you're like me, having like you know, 40 tabs per window and then 10 windows you know, per instance of Firefox and then four you know, profiles of Firefox all active at the same time, this is great, you know, okay? It just searches, you know, the title of each page. So you just have to type, you know, like a few words and then it will find a tab for you. I have uh, other plugins that can help me save everything. So I can turn off my computer, reboot, come back and just say, okay, restore everything. It goes like everything is going back to exactly where they were, including positions and, you know, all the tabs and whatnot. Doesn't look like many of you have the same problems that I do. <laughs> anyway, all right. So I'm going to show you a few things. Okay. So I'm going to give you a program that is absolutely stupid. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you a program that looks like this: no op, and let's give it an empty line here. No op, an empty line here. No op, an empty line here. No op, an empty line here. Okay. So the, the purpose is, where do you think each one of these no ops is at in memory? Okay, so let's focus on the one on row one. Where do you think is the location in RAM that that particular no op, op code is going to be located in RAM? The first available location in RAM, which is location zero, zero, right? 
What about the one on row three? Zero one, the next available location. Very good. And then the one before is going to be at location zero two, and then location zero three, and so on. So right now, we don't have the, well, I guess we do. <clears throat> we can definitely make it happen. So if you want to refer to the memory location of a particular thing, right now you have to kind of mentally track all of that. Okay. In other words, okay, let me show you an example here. <clears throat> so let's just say that I want to change a location uh, to another you know, value. Okay. So I will do an LDI instruction here. LDI register A with you know, I'm going to put a question mark here, which the assembler is going to complain about, which is fine. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. And then I'll do LDIB with another question mark here. And then I do a store to location, wherever A is pointing to with whatever is in B. Okay. And then, you know, put a no, uh, we'll, we'll put a halt instruction here. And then we'll just say that whatever this location is the location that I want to change. Okay. So this is going to be, there's a directive called byte. So what byte does, okay? So byte takes, uh, you, need a, you need to specify an integer after byte. So let's say 37 in this case. So what byte does is it reserves a byte and it initializes that particular byte to the bit pattern of whatever value that is to the right-hand side of the word byte. In this case, it is 37 in decimal. So can someone tell me what is the hexadecimal version of 37? Two five, very good, because it's two times 16, which is 32 plus five. So two five you know, would be the hexadecimal representation of the byte corresponding to location seven, I mean row seven, okay? So let's just say that I want to change this byte from uh, two five in hexadecimal to let's say one three in hexadecimal. That's the entire purpose of this program. So how would I do that? Well, if you look at in uh, row four, we talked about this instruction on Tuesday. And in fact, it is, this is one of the uh, ungraded assignment that I gave you on Tuesday. I asked that you guys you know, try this instruction, figure out what it does and how it gets, its, how it gets uh, the job done. I hope you have done that, okay? Because otherwise, you know, today's lab may be a little bit more difficult than it has to be. Anyway, so can someone tell me which register is in charge of dictating which location in RAM is gonna be changed? Register A, very good. So register A is the register that serves as the address, okay? It, it, it's the pointer, okay? It points to the location that will be updated to the value of register B, very good. So if I were to comment using RTL, this would be the same thing as this. <clears throat> okay, now, given I want this to change the location that currently after the program loads, has a value of two five, and I want to change that to one three. How should I initialize the two registers? LDI is only good for one thing, okay, which is to initialize the value of a register. Not what it points to, just the register itself, okay? It would change the, the value of a register itself. So let's do the easy one first, okay? And I would just even, I would write it down here. I want, um, the row seven location to change to hexadecimal one three. Okay, so how can we make, how can we make that happen? You should be able to figure this out because these are all the instructions that we have already talked about on Tuesday or before. Yes. Right, okay, so that would be the one three in hexadecimal. So which register should contain the value of one three in hexadecimal? Register B, very good. Okay, so let's focus on that one. This is the easier one. So we just have to change this. Now, if I change the assembler so I can accept 
um, hexadecimal values, that would be pretty easy. But I don't think I have made that change yet. So that's why, oh, actually it does accept that. I did not know. Let me see whether it actually gets the job done or not. Go to the assemble tab. And it does understand it. Okay, so <clears throat> this really kind of shows you how C now I have become. I have implemented a feature and I have completely forgotten that I implemented that feature into the assembler. It's one of those things, just one of those things. It's like, tech, what does this button do? I don't remember making that button in this car. Push it anyway, see what it does. That never ends well, especially in a James Bond movie. <clears throat> Q is going to say, don't touch that. Don't press the button. All right, so that's great. OK, so we got one, one problem solved. The difficult one is register A, OK? What, how should I replace that question mark on row two in order for um, the instruction on row four to end up putting the value of one three in hexadecimal to where that byte 37 is? Yes. Yes, very good. Okay, so I like that answer. <clears throat> we have to change this question mark on row two to the address of whatever byte 37 is going to have. So how would you do that? Well, you can, there are a few ways to do it, okay? So there's the cheater way to do it, which is to go to the assemble view and find out, okay, this is your byte 37, and according to the lab from Tuesday, column W is the address of the first byte on that row, which in this case only has one, and it is at location 07. Cool. So I can now go back to the source and just say, eh, I got it. It's seven. Yep. Why is that the address? Um, because it's an immediate. <laughs> it has to do with how the assembler is written. So anything that takes quote unquote immediate is in column Y. So that's why there's no column X because there's no actual opcode. There's no operation being specified. I'm directly specifying you know, what that byte should be. So there's no operation, there's no opcode to specify. And the opcode goes to column X. And that's why in this case, column X is empty because there's no opcode corresponding to byte. So byte, you know, as a, <clears throat> as a reserved word, byte is not really an op, it's not a mnemonic. It is actually called a directive instead of a mnemonic because it doesn't specify an operation. It is telling the assembler and say, hey, I just want to reserve a byte here, and that byte should have the value of 37 in decimal. That's basically what byte is, that, is doing. But it has to go to column Y because of, the, of how the assembler is written. And for those of you who really want to know how the assembler works, okay, I don't think anyone you know, here you know, really want to know that, but I'm going to show you anyway, just in case you want, to, you want to find out. So the assembler itself is actually um, data-driven. So this is a table that dictates you know, how the assembler works. So when you go to byte, okay, B-Y-T-E, which is down there a little bit, okay, so let's scroll down, da -da 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 -da, right here. So this row you know, specifies you know, how the byte word is going to be processed. Now, I'm not going to bore you with all the, you know, what each column is doing, but it's, this is how the assembler works, okay? The, the JavaScript code is in the spreadsheet, you know, but it is driven, it's data-driven. So it wouldn't be very hard for me to add a new instruction if I needed to, or to change the behavior or the syntax of an existing instruction. But we don't have to understand this part, okay? I just wanted to make, make it clear that you know, this is not something that you have to understand, but getting back to the assemble view, it does not have anything in column X and only the actual constant in column Y. But getting back, okay, then going back one more level, back to exactly why we are talking about this, um, we needed to go to the assemble view or actually do some counting to understand that on row two or line two, we need to use a seven in order to find out that, in order to specify the address 
of the byte 37. Is that okay so far? Does everybody understand what I just did? What I needed to do and how I got it done? Yes, okay, all right. Well, the other way to do this, okay, if you don't have the assembler and you're just staring at the source code, the other way to do this is to do your own counting, okay? So how do you count? Well, you just pretend that you are the assembler, but you're not generating the opcode. You just need to count the number of bytes needed for each line of the source code. Z location 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So I can do the counting myself too and figure out that byte 37 is at location 7. But every time you change the program, every time you add a line, every time you delete a line, you have to redo the counting for everything that relies on a certain location. So do you want to do that? Well, I guess you can say, I can do it if I have to. But do you want to do it? The answer is no, I don't want to do this you know, because this is really tedious. If I miscount by one location, I can end up you know, modifying the source code, of the, I mean the opcode of the program itself and cause all kinds of problems. Yes? How do you know how many bytes? Because I know how many bytes each instruction is going to take. So the first line, no op, has an opcode of zero, zero. It takes up just one byte. This one takes two bytes. Everything that ends with the I takes up two bytes. So LDI takes up two bytes. Uh, LDI you know, takes up two bytes. ST take up, takes up only one byte. HALT only takes up one byte. So anything that's not end up with I takes up one byte. Anything that ends up with I takes up two bytes as, in, as opcodes. Yes. Yes. That's because we use the, uh, the one byte after the opcode to store, quote unquote, the immediate constant. Yep, go ahead. Oh, okay, great, yep. So you can do your counting, you can rely on the assemble view, you know, but neither is, a, is the right way to do it. The right way to do it is to use a label. So a label is a bookmark. And the way you define a label is simply to go to right before the thing that you want to label, okay, and give it a name. So I'm just going to use a very generic name of L1. And when you're defining a label, you want a colon after the identifier. So L1 with a colon after that is the definition of a label. A label is the symbolic name of whatever location that label is corresponding to. That location is right after the halt instruction. So that means L1 as a label is defined to be the same location as byte 37. So now I have a symbolic name of the location of byte 37, and I can now reference that label <clears throat> when I need to re reference that label, which is here. So now I can say LDI A L1, and it would accomplish exactly the same thing. So are we doing okay so far with you know, the concept of a label? Yes, go ahead. That is correct. But you can have as many labels as you want in the program. There's, no virtual, there's virtually no limitation of how many labels you can define in the program. <clears throat> All right. Yep, go ahead. Yeah. You cannot have multiple uh, label definitions on the same line. So only one label definition, definition on the line. But you can have multiple labels corresponding to the same location. Yep. OK, I, can, I see what your question is, so I can give you an example. So we can change this to L2, and then just move your know, byte 37 down here. Then both L1 and L2 would be defined to 7 in this case. And the assemble view is actually very helpful. It will actually show you how L1, L2 they do not generate any bytes because a label does not have any presence at runtime. It is only an assemble time construct so that the assembler can use a label to connect references to where the labels are defined. <clears throat> are we doing okay so far with all those concepts? 
Okay, so labels are very useful, you know, especially when we need to specify, oh, go to that location to continue execution, which we'll talk about when we talk about the JMPI instruction. So we'll talk about that today. Are we good so far? Yes. They are defined as seven. They are simply symbolic names of seven in this case. <clears throat> now, there's one thing you can also look at. You know, I'm not sure whether you want to go there or not, but there is a tab called sim tab, which is symbol table, which only has one single cell that has a, I mean, has two more cells that has value, but this particular cell that, that is highlighted right now, that's the symbol table. It is represented as a JSON you know, representation or JavaScript object notation. Um, you don't have to understand this, but you can actually see how the definition goes. This is label L1, so internally everything is lowercase, which means it's case insensitive. Uh, it is defined on line five. After everything is resolved, it has a value of seven. So you might say, why don't you just say value is seven? Why do you say RPN is seven? RPN, by the way, stands for reversed Polish notation. We'll talk about this later, okay? Because you know, what you can use to define a label is not limited to just the address, okay? You can actually define a label to be anything that is quote unquote resolvable at assemble time. But we'll just not talk about that right now. We'll just say that you know, a label is only useful in this class to designate you know, a location of something in your program. But later on, we'll talk about a much more general use of labels. But okay, getting back to the original point, you can see how L1 has an RPN of seven, L2 also has an RPN of seven. They are basically defined to be the same thing. <clears throat> Are we doing okay so far with you know the use of labels? Okay. All right. So we are moving on to the next thing. Okay, so let me show you what I'm using to remind myself what to talk about. So the next one is compare CMP as an instruction. So the first thing is, okay, if when I introduce a new instruction, you know, one thing you can do is to go to the opcode table and just to find out what it does. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. And I have no idea where that tab is. So I'm just going to look up your know, opcode table. <clears throat> there we go. So op the opcode table, <laughs> and you guys are pretty quick to follow. Nice. All right. So CMP is right here on row 30. And you can see CMP and SUB are very similar. One is x equals x minus y, and the other one is just x minus y. In other words, sub, subtract, will modify register x after the operation. Well, okay, it will update x to be the difference between x and y, because I should not say it will change register x, because if you're subtracting zero from x, then it's not changed. So the more correct way is it will update to the difference between x and y. On the other hand, compare, which is on row 30, does not update anything. It just goes through the motion of the subtraction, but then it doesn't do a single thing. Yes. It does not return to anywhere. It will just proceed to the next instruction. So you go like, so what? what is, how is it going to be useful? So that means you know, it's, a, it's a good thing that we're going to demonstrate it, okay? Because it's, it's actually a very interesting question, interesting instruction. <clears throat> so we'll go back to the as assembler, and this time we'll write something that's actually somewhat useful. So we'll keep the same, um, let's see, I have to find the right tab, the source tab, there we go. I will keep this, okay? So this time I'll just say, you know, load A with seven, but instead, do, instead of doing a store instruction here, I'm gonna do a CMP. CMP, we'll say CMP AB which means we are actually going to, okay, I would use some comment here and say this is just going to go through the motion of subtracting B from A, but without storing the actual difference into register A. So it seems like a pretty useless instruction, 
But in reality, eh, it's actually really useful. I will also make a slight change. Instead of using seven, I'm going to change it to something that's more than 127. So we'll do a 253. Okay. And the reason will be a, will be clear in just a little bit. But right now, we'll just say that we are uh, changing register A to 253. And register B is still in hexadecimal 13, which is what? Uh, 19 in decimal. So we are going through the motion of subtracting 19 from 253, but without storing the result to any registers. All right. And we do have a no-op instruction here. That's kind of intentional because you know, later on I can now use um, the tracer to trace the execution. But at first, you know, we're not going to do that. So we go to the RAM file, okay, you see v2.0 raw, that means you know, the assembling is done correctly, you, we can now download this file. So I'm going to show this, yep. Well, it has to be after the halt instruction, because the 37 is not an opcode, I do not intend to execute it as an opcode. It's just a memory location that has a specific content, that's all. It's not even utilized in this particular program as it is now. All right, so we're going to download this as a CSV file, and I'll just say cmp.csv. <clears throat> and then we switch to the um, Logisim window, which I have put here, and go to the RAM, right click, load image, and then point it to the same file, which is in the temp folder. It's called cmp.csv and now the program is here all right so i'm not going to even bother to trace the first three instructions because one is no op one is ldi the other one is also ldi we have done those already on tuesday so i'm going to fast forward until we get to the compare instruction which is on uh, at location 05 there's no easy way to kind of skip execution until that time, so I'm just going to you know, tap Control T a little bit quick here. Ah, okay. I'm, I hope I'm not too late because it, it's right there right now. So let's check out the uh, microcode pointer and see where we are at in terms of the instruction execution cycle. We are, the clock is high, which means it's about to go low. The microcode pointer is at 0, 0, 0 already, and I can see that the instruction register has 6D in it. Um, so which phase of execution are we at at this point? We are about to have a falling edge. <clears throat> so the question, okay, another question you can try to answer is what are we going to do with the microcode pointer? Because the microcode pointer, oh, I take it back, okay. It's about to go through a rising edge, not a falling edge. Okay, so I stand corrected. Because the clock is dark green right now, so the next control T is gonna be a rising edge, not a falling edge. And we are at location 0, 0, 0 with the micro code pointer. So what phase of instruction execution are we at right now? The fetch, very good, okay, I like that. Okay, you know, so people actually do study, okay. Excellent. So we're going to fetch right now. So control T, we can see how the instruction register is now a E1, which is the opcode of comparing register A to register B. Control T, which is a falling edge, is going to increment the microcode pointer. There's no specific name for this particular operation. And then we have another rising edge right now. The program counter is going to auto increment because whatever opcode is at location 05 is already in the register instruction register. I don't need the program counter to be pointing to that location anymore. So control T increments the program counter. And then now we are going to have a falling edge, which means the micro code pointer is the one being updated. Can someone tell me what phase are we at at, at this point when we are executing an instruction? The decode, very good, okay. So after the decode, the microcode pointer will become E10, and then the ROM content at location E10 in the ROM is going to dictate you know, how things are connected. 
All right, very good. So control T, yep, it goes through the decode. So right now the clock is low and we are now at the execute cycle of you know, executing an instruction. So the question is, how are things connected? I'm gonna do a really, really quick check here. I'm not even going to explain how things are connected because you should be able to work that out now. <clears throat> we can see register A is F D. We can see register B is a one three, not you know, not surprisingly. So what we are gonna focus on is the ALU because we can see the ALU is enabled because the EN of ALU which connects to e ALU EN is a light green, which means the ALU is enabled, which means, you know, well, we probably want to check out what is going to happen this time. So right click, go to view a ALU, double click does not do the same thing. Okay, so do not try to double click to expand a component, always right click and then click view whatever the component name is. All right, so now we are inside the ALU. The first thing you want to know is what operation am I specifying? That's the job of op cell or operation select. It is 001, okay? Last week, okay, I believe last Thursday, we talked about addition and the operation is 000 because we were using the first component to perform that operation. This is operation 001, which means both inputs are routed to the second component by these to the multiplexer and then this multiplexer is taking the output of the second component, which is the subtractor, to become the actual output here. So let's double check whether that makes sense or not. This is our FD, and this is our 1,3. Okay, very good. So the question is um, FD minus 1,3 in hexadecimal. Does that, is that supposed to give me EA? All right, so I know I just said something that's probably hard to remember, so I'm gonna put it here. So we are subtracting FD, okay, FD minus a one three, and we want to perform this, you know, in hexadecimal subtraction. So what is D minus three? It's A, right? You just count backwards. F, D, and then C, B, and then A. So A is the correct digit here. <clears throat> and do we need a borrow? We won't need a borrow because three is not greater than D, so we don't need a borrow. Okay, that makes things a little bit easier. What about F minus one? It's an E, very good. So EA is supposed to be the output. So let's check out you know, in Logistim whether we are getting EA or not. One, 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 zero is an E, one, zero, one, zero is an A. So we do get the correct output here. But Tech, you just said something about, you know, the, the result is not going back to any one of the registers. First of all, how do we confirm that? How do we confirm that none of the four registers in the register bank is going to get updated? RIEN, very good. So you have to look at the RIEN here. It's dark green. So none of the four registers is going to get updated. I don't even care about what is RI cell because, you know, <laughs> regardless of how our, our I cell is set up, no register is gonna be updated, okay? Okay, so what else is going to be updated? I mean, this instruction seems utterly useless. You go like, wait, hold on a second here. I'm just tracking all the bright greens, right? Here's a bright green going into enable. The flags register is gonna be updated. So on the rising edge, the flags register is going to be updated. So if you know the flags register is going to be updated, and this is not one of the registers that we have really talked about, what is the next qu next question is going to ask? Yes. How is it updated? Right? You know, say, you know, I, I think that's what you meant, right? You know, who is providing the value to update the flags register, and what is the meaning? of those values that are being used to update the flags register. So let's track that down, okay? There are many ways to track things. You know, it all depends on how you ask your questions. So based on what I just asked, I am going to follow the, this wire, okay? It goes back to flags out of the you know, ALU, and now I go back to the ALU, 
and I go backwards, okay? I go to the flex out of output pin, and then I ask, okay, who, who are providing these values to you? Okay, we got five individual things, okay? We have C out, Z out, S out, O out, and then we got this thing, which is an exclusive OR between the sign and the overflow. Does it, have we talked about this? The exclusive OR between the sign flag and the overflow flag? It's called the L flag, okay? The L flag is useful in signed comparison, okay? So we did talk about that in binary comparison. So we'll, we'll kind of get back to that later, okay? Because right now, <clears throat> right now it's useless you know, to look at this and conclude this is the L flag because we have to first confirm exactly what is the O flag, what is the S flag, what is the Z flag, and what is the C flag. So we'll track each one down one by one, okay? Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So you can probably imagine that this is, this sounds a little bit tedious, but you know, it's okay, because we got some tools to help us understand this. Click on the wire, okay, and then you just look at what is highlighted. Or you can just kind of look at you know, what C out is, you know, it's right here. So C out, yes, go ahead. I am inside the ALU, because I track the D port of the flex register, and it is coming out of flex out of the ALU, so I'm tracking, you know, the flex out output pin of the ALU, and then go backwards to say, hey, bit zero is coming out of C out. What is C out? C out is the output of this multiplexer. Are we good so far? Okay. So it's a multiplexer, okay? We are looking at the output of a multiplexer. How do we track backwards from here? Look at the select, very good. So when you look at the select, which is always the port under the gray dot, this one goes back to OP cell, okay? You know, OP cell dictates all of the multiplexer and the demultiplexer inside the LU. So this, if you click on it, it just tells you it's a 001, which means this is feeding the output. Then your next question is, obviously, track this one down, okay? Who is you know, giving us the content at the B tunnel? So you look it up and go like boop, 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 up here. Go like ah, okay, I see that. You know, this is coming out of the subtractor. So this B port, okay, out of B out out of the subtractor, is basically our T seven. Okay, so if you're thinking about what do you mean by T seven, I didn't I did not know that they make that many Terminator movies. Not yet, okay? They will probably make a lot more movies after Arnold is dead. They can then use AI to generate that character, and they can go back in time, go forward in time. They can do anything they want with the AI-generated character. So yes, T7 will be here in the theater soon, like in the next 20 years or so. But at this point, no, T7 is not Terminator 7. What is T7? Yes. Close. It is the borrow, right? It's the it's the overall borrow of an eight by eight subtractor. Okay. Do you guys remember the borrow flag? The overall borrow. Okay. So this is the overall borrow when you have. Okay, let me just try to make it there. No, this is. I, I take it back. This is T eight. This is the sequel of you know, T seven. This is T eight because it's the one bit that is hanging out there of an 8-bit subtractor. So with an 8-bit subtractor, you have bit zero to seven being represented, right? You know, they are in the X, in the Y, and also in the difference in this case. And then T8 is the one that's hanging out on your left-hand side that is going like, oh, this is the overall borrow. In other words, if X as a whole is less than Y as a whole, interpreted unsigned, then B is going to be a one. I mean, the, in this case, T8 is going to be a one. Okay? So the question is, does that make sense uh, that B, a T8 is a, a zero in this case? Well, let's 
double check what we are subtracting. This is a FD and this is a 1, 3. Okay, interpreted unsigned, what is FD and what is 1, 3? So let's let let me let's let's all try to answer that question. Okay, so what is the VU of the bit pattern one 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 zero one, and we are using all eight bits. So what is that? All right. First thing, what is VU? V or the U is supposed to be a subscript, but since I can't really do a subscript in a text editor, that's what, that's the best I can do. But what is really asking is what is the unsigned value represented by 11111101 as a bit pattern? How do you figure that out? So you can, you can do it the hard way or you can do it the easy way. Do you want me to explain the easy way or the, or the hard way? Okay, go ahead. Yes. So what is the quote unquote max value in this case? Okay. So if all the one if if we have all ones, okay, we have which uh, natural number? Two hundred and fifty five. Very good. Okay. So two hundred and fifty five is what happens when you have one 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 one. So two from two fifty five. And what is missing here? It's missing a two. Very good. So it is indeed 253. Okay, all right. And then we ask the same thing about, you know, 1, 3, which is 0x, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and we're interpreting all 8 bits. This one is not too bad, okay, because you know, we actually did represent it in the base 10 representation earlier. But, you know, okay, I'll let you guys you know, try to figure this out. There are several ways to do it here, you know, but if I strictly use base two conversion, then we have one plus two plus 16, okay, which is what, 19, okay? <clears throat> so we have 19 over here. So now you ask the question, is 253 greater than or equal to 19? The answer is yes. So that is why T8 is gonna be a zero. Now, for those of you who go like, okay, can we have a quick review of binary subtraction so that I can actually see everything happening here? Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna put my thumbs up because I, I, I don't get to vote. Do you guys want to see that? Or do you guys go like, no, not that stuff again. We'll do it quickly, okay? So we have you know, 1111, 1101 minus 0001, 0011. All right, we'll do it the long way. But I'll do it kind of quickly. Okay, so I just make up all the bit positions. And now we go back and backfill stuff. This, is, this row is Q, which is the exclusive OR between the X and the Y. So let me comment on you know, what is X and Y. And then this is Q. This is T, and this is D. I hope this is looking a little bit familiar, okay? Because if it's not, then eh, I would be a little worried. Okay, so this is zero. I mean, let me turn it into overwrite mode. This is a one, one, one. That's a zero, that's a one, that's a one, that's a one. Because you know, these are the exclusive OR between the X and the Y of the same column. Okay, the T bits are a little bit more you know, difficult to, un to uh, compute. Not one and one is a zero, or not zero and zero is also a zero. Zero or zero is a zero, okay? So I'm just using the binary version of computing the T bits. <clears throat> um, how many people still remember all this stuff? Okay, good. So there's a one here, there's a zero here, uh, there's a zero here, there's a zero here, zero here, zero here, and one zero over here. This is B out of the subtractor, okay? 
But since I'm here, I might as well just finish the whole thing and you know, get to D. D is the exclusive or between the Q and the T. So I'm just going to work out from this end here because otherwise I have to move the cursor key or move the cursor all the time. So it is one, one, whoops, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Okay, something is not right. Something doesn't look right to me. No, it is, it does look right to me. Okay, so according to this, you know, we should get one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, zero, you know, when the whole thing is done, which is a EA. And I think we did get an EA in Logisim, so I think everything is working out. Yes? Why does the logic in zero Say again? Why does the logic of the mm -hmm. Because later on, we'll use it for making some decisions. Yeah, so right now, we are just focusing on how the flag register is updated, and then, then we're going to look into how, you know, uh, it's going to be used. I have no idea what just happened. I think you know, it, the connection is just loose. And we'll just, yep, okay. It's back, but something bad happened, okay? Because you know, I think um, the recorder is not recording anymore, so let me restart the recorder. That gives you guys a little bit of time to frantically write down stuff. Huh? No, it just, I just have to break today's recording into two parts, that's all. Um, it's still recording this portion, but I still I have to change the uh, have to change the uh, resolution. So I think that's a quick way to do this. Um, uh, nope. Can't remember the name of the subfolder that oh screen layout, there we go. Screen layout and then we have wave. There we go. Yeah, okay. Uh, the recorder is still recording, okay, so it looks like we are good. So there's no interruption of recording at, at all. We're, we're still good. Okay, so, yes, so I answer your question. We are recording, we are remembering the B flag for later, okay? What about all of the other flags? So in order to get that, we have to look at Logisim again, and Logisim got put into the other monitor because of the change of resolution. Now it's back here. I am monitoring the recorder. I'm monitoring OBS to make sure everything is still being recorded correctly. So far, it's so good. Okay, so that explains the B flag. What about the other flags? Look at the time. That's gonna be good. So we, but we, we are now done with the C flag because the C flag is basically the B flag, which is basically the overall borrow of the subtractor. What about the Z flag? Okay, so you highlight the Z flag and you see which other thing is also going to be highlighted. Ah, turns out to be this one here. All right, so looking at this picture, okay, let me kind of describe the splitter here because people in the back may not be able to see all the tiny little digits here. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, that's, so what are we doing? What is the Z flag? Why is it a zero this time? Well, it all depends on what kind of a, flag, of, a, of a gate this is. So what is that gate? Without a bubble, what kind of gate is, what kind of a gate do we have? <laughs> we are, or, this is an or gate. So with a bubble, it is a, is a nor, it's a negated or gate, okay? And what about the inputs? What am I feeding into this gigantic, you know, um, nor gate? The output of the subtractor, okay? The output of the subtractor, all A bits, okay? So those, basically I'm saying bit zero, nor bit one, nor bit two, nor bit three, nor bit four, nor bit five, nor bit six, nor bit seven. That is the Z out, okay? So how do you make a nor a one? It needs to be all zeros. If at least one of these bits is a one, it's going to be a zero as, a, as the output of the NOR of the NOR gate. So basically, the Z flag is a one if and only if the previous operation ends with a zero. Is that okay? I can say that one more time. 
the Z flag is a one if and only if the previous operation ends up with a zero as a result. Okay, that's the Z flag. It's pretty handy to have. You know, it's not 100% necessary, but it does make life a whole lot easier with that flag. So that's about the, all I have to say about the Z flag. Now we're moving on to the S out flag, okay, or this S flag. So now we look it up and go like, okay, where's S out? It's right here. Okay, that's a really awkward looking splitter because if you cannot read this digit, it says seven. In other words, we only look at bit seven of the output of the ALU and we just say, ah, this is our sign flag. Well, it makes sense, right? Because what we have right now is this input, input one of this multiplexer, is connected to the output of the subtractor, which is our D, the difference. So we are looking at D7 as the sign flag. That's exactly how it is defined when we talked about binary comparison. Okay, the sign flag is simply the most significant bit of the difference. That's the sign flag. So do we have any questions about the sign flag or the other flags that we have already talked about? Yes. That's a very good question because I really should, I forgot to cover that. <laughs> That's a good question. So, the, the, so let's answer that question first, okay? So the question is, what if we treat the bit pattern as a signed number, okay? So that would be VS, right? So we have 1111, 1101, and what would that be? Oh, comma eight, because we are reading, we're using all eight bits. Okay, so this one is a little bit more cumbersome, okay, because the definition of VS says, let's add up all the powers of two of the least significant bits, you know, except for the most significant bit. Let's add up all of those, but we subtract if the most significant, if the most significant bit is a one, then we subtract the power of two corresponding to that bit from the rest, okay? Which is, well, okay, so let's do that now, okay? So the rest of the bits, okay, would be 127 minus two, because 127 is the, uh, the value of 1111111, okay? When you have seven ones in binary, if they add up to 127. Yes? Yes, but I want to use the actual equation that I use to define Vs as a function. So I'm just following that you know, kind of mechanical way of doing this. But since the most significant bit is a one, so whatever power of two, which is 128, is corresponding to the most significant bit, is subtracted from the rest. So that's why we have this particular uh, thing here. And if you go through the actual subtraction, we have what, 125 minus 128, which is negative three. So that means uh, the bit pattern 1111, 1101 is representing negative three when we look at it as an eight bit signed integer. So is that good so far? Okay, so we might as well do the other one too. So let's do the other one, which is VS of 0001. 0, 0, 1, 1, and we use all eight bits. So in this case, we have one, uh, we still have the same thing, okay, which is one plus two plus 16, and we don't have to minus, we don't subtract the 120, 128, because the most significant bit, which is the sign bit, is a zero here. So we don't subtract 128. So when we add up your know, one, two, and 16, yeah, we still get that 19, which is exactly the way it's supposed to be. Okay, so are we good here? All right, okay. So let me switch back to Logisim. We have already explained all of the bits except for two. We haven't re really explained what is the O flag, and we haven't really explained what this is, okay? I kind of gave you an idea earlier, but you know, without confirming what the O flag really is, I can't really confirm this one either. So let's confirm what the O flag is. So you click on this, and you go like, okay, where is the O flag coming out of? It's coming out of this multiplexer, but remember what I said, all the multiplexers are selected by the OPSCL or the operation select, which means in this case, 
because it's operation one or zero, zero, one, it's using this particular input to connect to the output. So the question is, what exactly is that input? We know S out is the sign of the output of the ALU or whatever is the result of the operation. In this case, it's the difference. What about S1 and S2? Okay, well, we kind of need to look them up. So when we look up S1 and S2, this is S1 and this is S2. So can someone quickly tell me how, uh, what S1 and S2 correspond to in terms of you know the X, Y, Q, T, D um, row names that we use in binary subtraction? Yes. of X and Y. So S1 is really the same thing as X7, bit seven of X. S2 is the same as Y7, which is the most significant bit of Y. Okay? Yes? Yes, that would be the sign flag of the inputs. So now we go back to that circuitry down there a little bit, and then we say, mm, I don't think tech you, you have talked about this at all. <clears throat> well, let's let's see what it is doing. It is taking the negative version of the sine flag of x, and this is an AND gate, and the most significant bit of y, and the most significant bit of the difference, and it generates one of the output to the OR gate. On the other side, we have the non-negated sine bit of x, and the negated bit of of the negated sine bit of y and the negated sine bit of the difference. And then the result of this and is also going into this or here. Have we talked about that when we talked about binary comparison? Hmm? No. Can, can you say that again? The, the first word, sorry, I, I didn't hear. Is this the equal to? No, it's not the equal to. It is the overflow, very good. So this is the overflow flag of comparison. When we talk about binary comparison, this is how we computed overflow. It just looks weird when it is represented in logic gates and not represented in operators. But it really is the same thing. All right, so this is the overflow flag for subtraction. Nah, that's the overflow flag for addition, but we are not gonna be talking about overflow for addition yet. So this is going to here, you know, because this is a subtraction operation. So, <clears throat> so when we get down here, we finally see that, oh, this is just overflow, and this is just the sign of the difference. So what, is, what about the exclusive or between those two? We, we gave it a name because it's useful. Because you know, this flag, whatever I'm highlighting right now, is the one flag that you can rely on 100% of the time. It is a one if and only if V S X blah is less than V S X or V S Y blah. It is called the what flag? It's called the L flag, very good. Okay, it is the L flag, it is one, if, because it is a one if and only if the signed interpretation of X is less than the signed interpretation of Y. So if you, if you are thinking, hmm, these terms, they all sound really familiar to me, but I can't really quite recall the detail, that means you might want to jot down in your notes and go like, hmm, might need to review that particular module because it is all going to be tied in here, okay? That is the reason, okay, why we talked about binary comparison, why we talked about the flags. We talked about all of these flags except for the Z flag. The Z flag we didn't talk about when we talked about binary comparison, but we talked about the overall borrow, we talked about the sign flag, we talked about the overflow, and we talked about the L flag. So it's all coming back here. All right, so next question, why? Why do we compute all of these flags and why are we storing these flags into the flags register? So when, we, when I go back to the main circuit here, 
you can see how the flags register, which is right here, is going to be updated. And okay, I can remember which one is which one, and you probably cannot yet, okay, but you know, in time you will. This is the C flag, which means X is not less than Y from the unsigned perspective. Yeah, okay, I, I can get that, right? This one is a zero because it is not, they, they are not the same, okay? The subtraction did not end up with a zero, okay? This is a one because the result has the sign flag being a one. The difference has a sign flag being a one. Well, it's E, what is it? It's E something, okay? But if, it, if it's an E something, it means the most significant bit is a one. So that means it is a you know, negative value if you want to interpret it as a signed number. This is a zero because there's no overflow because we are subtracting a non-negative number from a negative number ending up with a negative number. Yeah, that can happen. We don't have an overflow. And this is a one here because this is after considering the sign flag and the overflow flag, we conclude that the signed interpretation of X is less than the signed interpretation of Y, and that is actually correct. So that's how we have these five flags. They are presented to the D port of the flags register. We are about to have a, a rising edge, which means that these five bits will be remembered in the flags register. Okay, so we'll just do a control T and it is now updated. So the flex register is now updated to one four because this is the four and this is the one of the one four. Are we good so far? Okay. So now the question is, how do we even use the flex register? Okay. Okay. So that's going to be answered, you know, in the next oh, 50 minus 36 is 13, okay? So we, we're going to answer this in the next 13 minutes. All right. So the tonight's lab does not have anything to do with this. So you do have like the entire weekend to review this material so that on next Tuesday, when your lab does involve your, what we talk about today, you'll be right on it. Okay. So the next instruction I want to talk about is JMPI. Okay. This is the instruction that will tell that will alter the execution path of your program so i'm gonna go back to the assembler okay where's my assembler ah i think i just skipped it uh, where is my assembler oh okay the <clears throat> when the screen changed to a resolution it moved my assembler to the other window. Let me go, let me put it back to where it is supposed to go. All right, there we go. <clears throat> so now we go to source, and then we just go like, eh, let's change this program a little bit here. And I'm going to specify JMPI to location zero. So JMPI, you know, the I means you know, it needs an immediate operand, and you can specify a zero and it's an operand here. Yes. Um, yeah, we can recreate that, you know, the, the flex register when we need it. Yep. Okay. So this is not quite the stupidest program, but it is the second stupidest program that I can write. Okay. Is it most stupid or stupidest? Because I don't want to sound really stupid. It's the most stupid. Okay. So this is the second to the most stupid program that I can write. But because I know how to use most stupid instead of stupid dist, so this is also second to the most stupid thing I can ever do that I can say. If you don't get it, that's okay. Because I'm just being stupid. <laughs> anyway, so let's see what this program looks like from the RAM file perspective. Zero, zero, four, zero, and then the zero, zero. Okay, so we can, we can just kind of I would use the word poke into the RAM content here. That word, P-O-K-E, poke, you know, in order, you know, basically it's injecting content into RAM, is actually a command in AppleSoft Basic so that you can actually um, program the machine code into 
the original Apple II computer, but without going through an assembler. So it's a, it's a funny thing you know, that people used to do. You guys are way too young. Even your parents may not remember that day, those days. Anyway, let's start to run this program. So zero, zero is no op, you know, okay, it's not very interesting. So we'll just go ahead and get through that code, done. Okay, now we're on to four zero, which is our JMPI instruction. So we'll go through the, the uh, decode, the fetch, decode, and now we execute. All right, so we want to figure out, so tag exactly what is this doing? I could have gone to the opcode table and tell you exactly what this is doing, but I want to kind of go through this exercise so that we kind of do the little detective work that we have talked about. Okay, I typically want to look at RAM first because if RAM is active, there are a few other follow-up follow -up questions I can ask right away. So in this case, RAM is active. RAM cell is a one. RAM load is, a zero, is also a one. We are reading from RAM. So the first question is, who is telling me where to read, okay? So we track down the A port, and we go to the multiplexer, we select this one, we track down input one, and then we find that, ah, it's coming out of the program counter. The program counter tells me to go to location two to read from that location. So the follow-up question to that is, so who's making use of the content at location two? So now we track down this thing, and then we see, you know, who is updating. Instruction register, eh, no, it's not updating. It has a input, I mean, enable of zero. None of the registers inside the register bank is updating because uh, inputs, register input enable is dark green. Um, this goes into a multiplexer. So I, had, I need a little bit further investigation because this, this multiplexer does have a select of one, which means input one, which is what I'm highlighting right now, is connected to the output, yeah, but it better track it down. So now this one is going into another multiplexer, which has an input select, which has a select of one, and this is actually input one. So now I have to track this one down too. Oh, it goes to the program counter. And the program counter is enabled. It is about to update. In other words, I am taking <laughs> the content of location two to update the program counter itself. Yes. It is the is a it is second to the most tight infinite loop you can get. And I said it's second to the most tight or the tightest. Okay, I just sounded really stupid. So this is second to the tightest. See, English is not easy, okay? Because sometimes you say most and sometimes you just say ist. So I blame it on the language. So this is the second to the tightest loop I can write because you can actually have the loop to go back to itself. Instead, it, this goes back to the instruction before it. So it's not the tightest. Are there any questions? Yes. Oh. Okay. So the, another perspective of is instead of asking who you're asking, you can also look at it from the perspective of they can think of you differently depending on which word you use. <laughs> yes. The question is, do I care? There you go. <laughs> See, all of these follow-up questions, you know, when you ask me a question, they go like, oh, okay, I got five additional questions to ask. That is how my mind works, and I'm sorry, sometimes it does make the class a little bit harder to follow. Yes, you can judge me. All right, so when I do a control T right now, what do you think program counter is gonna change? How is it gonna change? It changed to zero, zero. That's right. I have just directed the program to go like, in the next fetch cycle, the next fetch phase, go back to location zero, zero. But we were just there. Yes, I know. We are going back there. This is looping. Is that okay? And we got six more minutes to talk about conditional branch, which is the fun thing, which ties everything that we talked about today together, okay? 
So let's go back to the assembler and change it just a little bit. This time we say JCI. Okay. This time I'm going to go to the opcode table to take a look at a few things. First, we take a look at JMPI. Ah, tech. I think you just said that. The program counter is updated by whatever it's pointing to. Okay, so the RTI represent RTL, sorry, the RTL representation actually tells you how things are supposed to be hooked up. But when we get to JCI, looks like this. That's a ternary expression because it's trying to say if the C flag is non-zero, then we use whatever the program counter is wanting to to update the program counter. Otherwise, we just add one to it. In other words, this is the only way you can make decisions when you're writing programs in assembly language. Okay? So, let's go ahead and do this. This is, this is really magical. This is one of the most interesting instructions of the entire thing. So, we, uh, let's see. So the opcode is, what, 4-4, four, four, okay? So, so instead of just you know, reassembling the whole thing, I'm just gonna <clears throat> poke the, the code here so it becomes 4-4. Four, four. There we go. And I need to make sure clock is low. There we go. Oh, I need to click uh, Control-T. I need to make sure it's low. And then I can make use of the reset button that I have talked about but never used so far. So I can now go to the reset button, which is here, click. All right, so it reset the processor without resetting the RAM. So now we still have quote unquote infinite loop, but it's not necessarily infinite. Well, okay, it is an infinite, but it's infinite in different ways. But the point is, when I get to this instruction, I get to show you the two ways that the program counter can potentially be updated, okay? So we'll, we'll kind of fast forward to that point. There we go. And then we want to make sure that we go to get through the decode, but not to execute yet. Okay, so now we are decoded, but not executed. All right, so we want to figure out how the program counter is going to be updated. Because the program counter is enabled. In other words, it is going to be updated. We also know that RAM is active. The question is, how is the C flag going to influence everything? So right now, because the flag's register was reset and it's becoming zero, zero, so let's find out what happens when the C flag is a zero. How do we decide how to update the program counter? So when the, flags, um, when the C flag is zero, so we, okay, there are two ways to track this. One way is to track from the program counter's perspective. So we look, when we look at the program counter, we look at the D flag or the D port. The D port is coming through the MUX here and this time we question why is PC MUX a zero? Okay, so that's the question we, we are asking. Why is PC MUX a zero? PC MUX is the output of this multiplexer, which means we have to look at this select you know, bit pattern here. This is zero, 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 which is determined by the ROM. This is coming straight out of the ROM, which means it is a part of the 26 bits in the ROM for that location. But the job of these three zeros is meaning is telling the multiplexer to connect input zero to the output. In other words, it is specifically looking at this input to become PC MUX. Why is this zero? This is going straight out of the flags register. In other words, the C flag through the way we pro we use this multiplexer becomes PC MUX which in return selects how we update the program counter. Because PC MUX is a zero, it is just going to be incremented. The program counter will simply increment because a zero to the multiplexer that I just pointed to selects the path from the increment mechanism. Yes. Yes. Yep. So now the question is, well, so what if the carry flag is a one? What if the C flag is a one? Do we have to redo this whole thing? No. Nope. I can poke a value into the flags register. So I can just say you know, one here, 
because that one is bit zero. So now I have just intervened and just say, let's pretend that the carry flag is a zero and see what happens, right? <clears throat> so you can see how bit zero of this splitter is now becoming a one, which then becomes PC mux. How is that influencing how we update the program counter? Because PC mux is also here, it is acting as the select of this multiplexer. So now we are selecting the other input of the multiplexer to update the program counter. This is coming out of this multiplexer, the select to this multiplexer, which can be explained by this you know, AND gate here, is also a one, which means we now have to track down this input here. And can you guess where it goes? The D part of RAM, exactly. So this is the decision-making mechanism of the processor. All the conditional statements, all the loops, all everything that ends up with a condition so that you can decide, you can choose to do it this way or the other way in a higher, program, higher level programming language boils down to this kind of mechanism. Now, is it gonna be exactly the same in every processor? Probably not but it's gonna be something like this. Yes, go ahead. Because you can only, okay, because when I designed the instruction set, okay, there's a whole family, okay? If you go to the <clears throat> opcode table, there's an entire family of instructions here. So each flag has its own J blah I instruction so that we focus on just one flag at a time. You can see how, you know, uh, C, Z, S, O, L, each one has its own J something I instruction. So we can focus on just one flag and say, hey, if this flag, if and only if this flag is a one, we'll continue execution, you know, as specified by the operand. Yep. Sort of, okay? So when you're talking about your know, logical AND and logical OR, there are ways to sequence these, you know, JMP, uh, JMPI and the conditional branch instructions. There are ways to structure them so that you can end up, you know, being, you know, in basically implementing the logical AND and the logical OR in C and C++ or just about any high level programming language. So I know I'm just a little bit rushing here, but this is what ties everything in, okay? This, the significance of today's lecture is we're looking inside the processor, okay? We have been doing that for, what? This is the third class you know, that we look into the processor itself. So that part is not new. We looked at um, compare, okay? Which is one way to set the flags, which ties into what we talked about when we talked about binary comparison. When we talked about binary comparison, we, we came up with all these flags and going like, but why are these flags important? Especially the O and the L, okay? Why are they important? Because they seem pretty artificial. This is why, because we use those flags to make decisions. Now, we'll talk about you know, how to structure the JXI instructions you know, so that we can make, you know, we can actually implement comparison operations. So we'll talk about that. But we also looked into JMPI instruction, which is an unconditional branch instruction. How do we change the path of execution? Well, we just go to that location, grab that byte, and overwrite the program counter with it. Then we alter the path of execution. The JXI, X being C, Z, S, O, L, okay, one of the five flags, is the conditional branch, which is, the, which is what we just talked about, okay? So instead of just saying, okay, every time we get here, we're gonna go back over there. Now you can say, well, we, all, we want to go there, but if and only if this flag is a one. Otherwise, I'm just continue to move on as if the instruction did not do a single thing. Yes? Yes. Something I, yep. Yep, yep, that's exactly. So um, if you want to read a little bit for, uh, ahead of the class, which I really recommend, um, the next module, okay, so I do know that we are using a little bit more time, but I think it's important because you do have a longer weekend. See, 
longer, you know, versus more, you know. <laughs> it's one of those things. It's like, ugh. okay, so where is Canvas right here? You can read ahead, okay, because you know, the next module talks about um, how do we quote unquote compile programs. When you look at C and C++ or any high level programming language um, code, when you see a conditional statement, how do you translate that into assembly code? So where we are at at this point is today's lab is this one, okay, I can just expose it right now and I'll give you the access code in just a little bit. So we are basically done with um, the von Neumann architecture and memory and we are moving on to TTP, SM tools and techniques. There's, there's nothing to do here because they are just you know, tips and tools to use uh, the assembler. So the next actual big lecture, okay, that you can actually read ahead is compiling C control structures. So if you have time over the weekend, I certainly hope so, this is where you should be reading, okay? Now, I, it's a little bit complicated, at least you know, toward the end, but the first few sections you know, should be fairly easy to understand because it doesn't even need, you don't even need to understand assembly language programming. It's all C at the first part, okay? So read that part first um, over the weekend. So now let's, let me go back to the lab today so that you know the access code. And I'll un, I think I just unhit it, there we go. The access code is just LDI all lowercase right there. All right, I'll see you guys in a bit. And I'll give you guys your 10 minutes back, you know, it's not a problem. I think most of you will be done quickly for this one.